Bezat Hashem, Naase Venatzliach. I want to welcome you to the Lighthouse Project. I'd like to welcome all the regulars and all the new faces to the room. We are uh, part, right in the middle of a new series that we just started called Did You Know? A lot of very interesting topics within the Jewish religion that you might not know. And we delve into each one every week. Uh, this week's class is called Generation of the Dog. Very, very interesting. Before we get started on our class, we'd like to give an honorable mention to our sponsors. We have a nightly co-sponsor, Sarah Shulevitz, who is doing this in honor of doing this for Shiduch and children for Sarah Baila Bat Penina and Aliza Aidel Bat Sarah, Health and Long Life for Rabbi Shalom Ben Yafa Shindol, Penina Bat Chaya Ethel, and Aliza Bas Rocho, and for the Rufua Shelema of Menachem Mendel Ben Sarah Batia and the Rufua Figa Bat Rezo. This class also has its own sponsors, Baruch Hashem. We have our Yisachar Zavalun sponsorship from our good friend, uh, a, friends H&M Builders, doing this in memory of their grandfather in honor of the Dornbush family. Be'ezat Hashem, may the Dornbush family have a lot of Hatzlacha in all their endeavors, a lot of Hatzlacha in the, in the new marriage, in the new baby girl, and Be'ezat Hashem, Be'ezat Tovot for that uh, family. Also, for a very good friend, a righteous woman from the East Coast, uh, we have Miss Esther Bouton, who is doing this in honor of her sons, Yonatan, Michael, Eliyahu, and Shalom Ben Esther. Be'ezat Hashem, the entire family has a big spiritual elevation. Be'chavat Sacha, a lot of simcha and happiness, and that they uh, merit to have a big, big Yeshuot. Also, we have Anonymous doing this, Leilu Nishmat Ayel Lei Ben Yoshua Zichonon Livracha, and in honor of Shlomo Dvor Ben Chai Esar on his 80th birthday. Chazaku Baruch. May you continue to have Arichat Yamim. Amen. Amazing to see Jewish people supporting Torah, supporting classes, being part of it, making it happen for us to be here. And as we are here, you can see that we're sitting around the table, you should know hundreds, sometimes thousands are watching these classes online, so it's a great thing, uh, the lighthouse of what we have going on over here. Okay, let's get started. The generation of the dog. Tonight, we're going to take, yes please, tonight we're going to take a closer look at the dog. We're going to look into the history of the dog. And all is going to be through the eyes of the Torah, Chazal, and their Midrashim, and the Talmud. And we will answer questions like, what are the best and worst qualities that the dogs have? Who was the first dog owner in history? What did the Egyptians' dogs do that changed the fate of all dogs throughout history? What is an Anubis? Why would a human get reincarnated as a dog? Very interesting questions. How are dogs connected to Amalek? Our arch rival. Mm. What is the connection between babies and dogs? Halachically, are we allowed to own dogs? No. And why have do dogs become so popular with women lately? What is this trend of women and little puppies? And why is this generation called the generation of the dog? These are all questions that we're going to answer tonight. All very, very interesting. And in order to get a better sense for things, we always have to go to the beginning. To the beginning of time. We have to go back to Bereshit. And in Sefer Bereshit, we come across creation. Adam HaRishon 
and the creation of all the world and all the animals that are, live within it. And on the sixth day when Adam Rishon came to be, he looked around and he saw all the animals. And he had a special gift. He had a gift where he could look at the animal and see the essence of the animal. And according to the essence of the animal is how it gave it a name. If you look in, uh, in the Jewish words, in the, I'm sorry, in the Hebrew words for animals, they all have a meaning. A dog in Hebrew is called Kelev. Why? Chazal tell us because Kulo Lev. He's all heart. That's why he's called a Kelev. And a dog, even though his essence is all heart, and we see that, anyone who's come across or has had any interactions with dogs knows that for a fact. But a dog has different characteristics. Some that are positive, some that are negative. Some that are good, and some that are terrible. Some of the good characteristics of a dog is that they're very loyal. They're very faithful. They're very friendly. They're very social. They're very playful. They're also very useful. We know that dogs can be used to sniff out cancer, sniff out bombs, sniff out uh, drugs in airports. Many service dogs have saved many lives. They're also very therapeutic. There's many dogs that are a real lifesaver to people. Dogs that uh, give company to inmates in jails, to people that are sick, to people that are lonely. Some dogs have a certain uh, medicinal, not just a quality, things that it's not, it's not even explainable, the relationship that a human being can have with a dog that helps them through their human experience. They're also very protective. Very protective of their owners. Many times have even been used as guard dogs. Many times have also been used as fighting dogs. Also, they're also known to be, on the flip side of things, a bit selfish. Dogs like their stuff. Don't touch their toy. Don't touch their blankie. Don't touch the things that they like. They're very egotistical in nature. They can also be very aggressive. Now, keep in mind, there's times that we're going to talk about the little furry animal that's super cute, but there's also those different types of dogs that are out there. They're also very aggressive and bold. They're also very brazen. In Hebrew, it's called Az. They're also ruled by their desires. Dogs don't like to share their food and they're also engulfed by their desires. They have an insatiable appetite. Dogs can always eat more. And they also always have a desire to mate. And we'll see the root for that later on in the class. And they also have a very interesting uh, character trait where they're overprotective of their masters but hate other animals. Dogs for many years have been a street animal. Just recently, well, they've been a street animal with just a few breeds that have been domesticated. We've seen in history that dogs have, ever, even, have even been in, in castles and been uh, kings and queens uh, sitting on kings and queens laps but recently the dogs are peaking in their popularity a dog's life is not that bad anymore dogs have it good nowadays more than ever before they have gourmet food 
special homes with air conditioning. Rarely, you don't see them roaming the streets unless it's a third world country. Have special pillows, sweaters, hats, boots. They have a doggy sitter, a doggy stroller. They have veterinarians that take care of them. They have humans picking up their poop. And they're even being pampered like humans. Never before, never before has a dog had it this good. They've even become a fashion accessory. You see the rich and famous toting around their little teacup puppies. And girls everywhere around the world are now obsessed with dogs. Small dogs, teacup dogs. What is this obsession? Where does it stem from? Well, we'll get to all that. So who was the first dog owner in history? Again, for this we have to go all the way back to Bereshit. The first dog owner? Adam? No, it was his son. You were close. Adam had two kids, Cain and Hevel. Hevel was a sheep herder and he had a dog. Pirkei Derbi Eliezer says, "Hakelev shaya meshamer tzono shel Hevel, who ayah meshamro mechayat asade umof hashamayim." He says that Hevel used to first have a dog that used to help him with the sheep herding, but would also protect him from the wild beasts in the field and dangerous birds. Ironically, after Cain kills Hevel. I'm sorry, kills Hevel. We get into another story that involves a dog. It says that Cain got a special ot from God, a special sign, symbol, or a letter from God after ki- killing uh, Hevel. I'll give you the story. Cain and Hevel are fighting. Hevel is winning. He's on top. Cain does the classic, oh no, no, let me go, let me go. I'll stop. As Hevel lets up, Cain grabs a rock and hits him over the head and kills him. The Gemara goes through it a little bit more that says he stabbed him about 30 times or bit him about 30 times because he didn't know which way the soul comes out. But he killed him. After he killed him, he did Teshuvah. He says, God, forgive me. I didn't know what I was doing. God forgave him. And the Pasuk says, Vaisem Hashem lekain ot. God put on Cain an ot. Actually, the full pasuk says, "Vayomer lo Hashem, lachen kol hore Cain shivatayim you come vayasem Hashem le Cain ot lebilti akot uto kol motzon." He says, "I know that every person that sees you is going to want to kill you. Why? Because you murdered twenty-five percent of the planet. At that time, there was just four people on Earth: Adam, Chava, Cain, and Hevel." He says, you, "Everyone that sees you is going to say you killed my uncle, you killed my uh, uh, my family." So in order for him not to get killed, he put an, a, a letter on his head that whenever somebody sees it, so leave him alone. Hashem is protecting him. However, Chazal tell us that that ot, that symbol, was not a letter. It was actually a dog. God gave him a dog to walk in front of him to protect him, but also to learn from him. Why? Because the dog was a symbol, a sign that he can learn from. A sign where he can learn from the dog loyalty. That he can learn from him faithfulness. God put a dog in front of him so he could learn the characteristics that he was missing with his, in the fiber of his being with his relationship with his brother. You were losing. Your brother was winning. You're ingrate. You kill your brother. Who can teach you better how to have loyalty and faithfulness and uh, and unconditional love like a dog? So, Cain walked with the dog to learn 
how to not to be an ingrate. That was the ot that Hashem put in front of him. As we fast forward through Sefer Bereshit, we come, through, come across another sheep herder, Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, we know, was also a sheep herder. At the time when he worked with Lavan, after, uh, after he worked with Lavan, he went off on his own. Later on, when he was in Mitzrayim, he had, they, gave them, uh, they gave the Jews, the Egyptians gave the Jews the, the plot of land called Goshen. Why? Because fertile for uh, grazing for the animals. Hazal tells us that the Yaakov Avinu had 6,000 dogs. And, and another Midrash says 600,000 dogs. Could you imagine? Because he had so much flock. Now, when they were living in Goshen, because of the fertile land for the grazing of the livestock, they were a welcomed guest in Egypt. However, after the death of Yosef, and the rise of the evil Paro, the Jews were turned from a welcomed guest to a slaved, an enslaved nation for 210 years. And at the grand finale of their slavery in Egypt, Hashem brings forth 10 plagues. And when the Jews are supposed to leave Egypt on the 10th plague of Makat Bechorot, Me'am Loez brings a beautiful story involving dogs. He says, Egypt was set up in a way where in order to enter the middle of the city, there was all gates all around. If you remember, the 12 Shevatim all came through a separate gate. So the city was set up like that. And on each gate, they had an image of an animal. A cat, a bird, a dog, a monkey. Each gate had a different image or a different statue of an animal. And we know that Egypt took nine-tenths of the wizardry and sorcery of the world. All the kishuf of the world, nine-tenths, 90% of it was in Egypt. 10% was everywhere else. So we know that Paro had the uh, Khartoumim. And these Khartoumim were wizards. They knew how to use black magic. And what they did is they implemented a special alarm system for Egypt. And the way that this alarm system worked is that anytime somebody tried to escape from Mitzrayim, according to which gate they came out of, that particular animal would come alive. So for example, if it was a bird, that bird would come alive and every bird in Egypt would start to make noise. And then everybody would know that somebody's trying to escape through that particular gate. <coughs> You know, when the Jewish people went to Mitzrayim, in the end of Sefer Bereshit, it says they went to Mitzrayim Ma. Mitzrayim Ma, Mem, on the bottom is open a little bit, and the He on the end is open a little bit. That means it was, you can come in and you can get out. In Sefer Shemot, it doesn't say Mitzrayim Ma. It says Mitzrayim. Why Mitzrayim? The Mem is open. You can come in. Mem Sofit is closed. There's, there's no getting out. So when they were in Mitzrayim and they couldn't get out, Anytime somebody would leave, they needed this alarm system, especially when they have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Jews that are slaves. Each one is valuable free labor. So on this particular night, when the Jews were supposed to escape, it says that the Jews exited from the gate of the dog and not one dog barked. The Pasuk says, It says, not one dog barked. On that word, we see that uh, in Baba Kama, in the, in the Talmud, it brings over there on the 60th page, I believe. It says, when a dog is barking at night, Malach is coming. 
when you hear dogs laughing, Eliyahu Navi is in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, on Makat Bechorot, who's in town? The Grim Reaper. The angel of death. The devil himself is coming around to kill. What should the dogs do? They should bark. They didn't. The alarm system from the witchcraft. <laughs> they should all bark. They're all leaving from this gate. They didn't. So it says, because of that act of not barking during the exodus, they merited to something. Hashem gave him a big bonus. They merited to, I'll read this from uh, directly, Vanshe Kodesh Tiyun Li, Ubasar Basade Trefa Lotochlu Lakilev Tashlichunoto. We have a special thing. Anytime a piece of meat becomes categorized as trefa and we're not allowed to have it, we're supposed to take it and give it to the dog. Which is a huge gift. Since for the dog, the meal are far and scarce in between. Don't forget, it's a street animal. There's not always food in the street. We're not talking about the dogs of today. As a matter of fact, God created the dog with chesed. Did you know that a dog can hold his food for three days? Hashem made it that his digestion works super slow. So like that, whatever meal he eats can hold him up to three days. Why? Because you don't know when the next meal is coming. It's a street animal. And because of that, when you give a, a street animal like a dog, a trefa, it's a bonus, a big juicy steak, a big juicy animal. That was its reward. Furthermore, we have Perik Shira. Perik Shira is something very interesting. Big, big segula to say this. Once a week, every day, whenever you can. Perik Shira is a... Is, is basically dealing with all of God's creations. It talks about what every animal's pasuk is. What does the dog say? What does the cat say? What does the duck say? What does the frog say? And I heard a beautiful chidush on this saying that the, 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 that the fact that the Jewish people say perk hashira on a regular basis is what gives all these animals the chayut to continue in this world. Us saying their pesukim gives them their success in this world. We give it the chayut. Unbelievable. But perek shira, there's one for each day. Uh, there's seven, I'm sorry, there's seven uh, perakim. I'm sorry. Six, six perakim. At the end of the sixth perek, it says something very, very interesting. That took me years, years until I found an answer that made me feel like, ah, okay, now it makes sense. Because if you hear it for face value, it's a little bit off. Rabbi Shaya Tamido Sherbi Hanina Ben Dosa Itana Hamesh Munim Taniot talks about a rabbi, Rabbi Hanina Ben Dosa, that did a Taanit. He was, he did 85 Taaniot in Amar. כלבים שכתוב בהם, והכלבים על זה נפש, לא עדו סובה, יזכו לומר שירה. He says, he wanted to understand, how is it possible, dogs, that is written about them, that they're brazen, that they are never insatiated, that they're never full, that they always want, they're filled with desires, they merit to say a song to God? Meaning it's such a lowly animal. Remember, back in the days, calling somebody a dog was a curse. Nowadays, they're like, what's up, dog? What happened? How did we turn? It's completely different. But you can see, he doesn't understand. The rabbi can't grasp how such a lowly animal can have the merit to speak, uh, to have a shira to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And an angel answered him from the heavens. Yeshaya, How long are you going to torment yourself? How long are you going to torture yourself and do all these taniyot about this particular question? 
שבועה היא מלפני המקום ברוך הוא. This is what הקדוש ברוך הוא decided. מיום שגילה סודו לחבקוק הנביא, לא גילה דבר זה לשום פעם העולם. He says, since I revealed the secret to the prophet חבקוק, I never revealed the secret to anybody else. אלא בשביל שתלמידו של אדם גדול אתה בדיו, because you're a great student, I'm, I revealed it to you. שלחוני מן השמיים, לזקק אליך ולהגיד לך לפני מה זה החוק, כלומר משה, he says, and now they sent me from the heavens, especially to teach you why the dogs merited to be able to say a, a, a song to God. לפי שכתוב בהם, as it's cited in the פסוק, ולכל בני ישראל לא יחרץ כלב לשונו. Like it was said in the time of the Yetziat Mitzrayim, that a dog didn't uh, uh, open up its mouth or didn't bark in the time of Yetziat Mitzrayim. ולא עוד, not only that, אלא שזכו לעבד אורות מצועתם לכתוב תפילים זאת וספרי תורה. Rather that you also uh, were used to tan leather that is used for Torah תפילין אין מזוזות with their excrement. על כן זכו לומר שירה, that's why they merited to that. Now, I have to stop over here. How is it possible that our holy Torah is even coming in contact with dogs' excrement? תפילין, מזוזות, these are the holiest things that we hold. Look what the Sefer Shira is telling us. What's going on? Leave that hanging. Or in regarding to the question you asked, Go back on it, don't, don't ask on it anymore. Like it said, Like it is written, The one who protects his mouth and his tongue, Is the one that protects himself from troubles. Okay, that's the literal translation. Let's go into it a little bit. First question, why did dogs merit to have the Torah scroll Mezuzah and Tefillin written from scrolls tanned in their excrement? How could that be? So again, I couldn't understand, I couldn't understand until one time Baruch Hashem just as listening to Parashat Teshavua lesson, Rabbi Baruch Rosenblum from Israel threw this little zinger in there and I was like so happy that day. He says that the reason why they used the dog's excrement to tan those leathers is because it was the best thing, it was the best agent, the best product to get the hairs off the leather. You know, the, the, the parchment, it's just a, a, a skin of a cow. That's where we get our mezuzot, it's parchment. Parchment is the skin of an animal. And an animal has hairs on it. And the best thing, like today, we would have, uh, I don't know, nair? What do the ladies use to get the hair off? They would maybe use that. Nowadays, back in the days, there was nothing better than dog excrement, that he would put it right on it, and they would take it off. So I said, but you know what? That's very, very interesting. But the, next, the last time that I heard about something that is connected to the bathroom and is connected to Kedushah is something that we say every day in our tefillah in the Ketoret. In the Ketoret it says, this is also very, very interesting. It says, Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel, He says we were bringing, he were talking about the samamanim, all the different uh, incense offering, all the different parts to it. And they're saying, why did we bring this? And why did we use that? And how did we apply this? And why, you know, how did we bring, they, they talk about each part of it. It's a whole Gemara. In order not to go into the whole thing, I'm just going to go into one part that says, they're asking about the tzipurin. Tzipurin is the frackens, Frankincense? Frankincense. Frankincense? I think that... So what's Tzipurin? Let's leave it hanging for now. Tzipurin is something else. So this Tzipurin. 
So they say, why do we put the Borit uh, Karshina? Why do we put the special agent together with the Tsiporin? He says, so like that it will be strong, that will be the, the, the essence, the smell will be, the musk will be strong. They say, What's meraglaim? What are the water of the feet? Urine. Meraglaim is urine. So they're saying, why would you use that agent? Why don't you just use urine? It's a better agent to bring out the smell. We could use urine to bring out the better uh, smell out of that particular incense, but because we're using it Bet and because of the honor of Bet HaMikdash, we're not going to use it. So you can see that there's a concept that you were able to use things that are very disgusting to us, but they had qualities that were able to be used. And one of the qualities in the... Uh, uh, in the Ketoret was the urine. Here, the quality was the dog's excrement was the best thing to get the hairs off of the off of the parchment. And that's a merit. It's a schut that the dog uh, can have that. So, the next question is on the last part of that Perik uh, Shira, it says Al tosif b'davar zeh. He tells him, "Don't continue uh, speaking about this." K'mosh shekatuv, as it is written. Where was it written? In Mishle. Mishle. This is Shlomo Amelech, the smartest man to ever walk this planet. What does he say about it? He says, "Shomer pivul shono, shomer mitzayot nafsho." He says, "Anyone who guards his mouth, who guards his tongue, he's going to protect himself from all the troubles." Well, shomer piv. We know very well that anyone who speaks Lashon Hara, he comes back as a Gilgul. He gets reincarnated again. As what? As a dog. Why? Just like as a dog doesn't stop barking, bah, 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 always talk, mouth always open, Hashem says, just like you couldn't keep your mouth shut, always talking, bah, talk about this, talk about that, like, just like a dog, your mouth is always open, you come back in a Gilgul as a dog. Shomer piv l'shono, shomer mitzahot nafsho. How important it is to guard your mouth. And Masechet Brachot talks about a lot of Gilgulim. Over there you'll see, also talks about uh, the reincarnations. Also in dreams. In dreams, if when somebody dreams about a dog, it's a sign that, uh, take it easy on the l'shon ara. <laughs> You're going off. <laughs> Bring it back. They're sending you a message from up above. And... This reincarnation of a dog is also very, very interesting. Hazal tell us that sometimes the reincarnations of the dogs happen to be a person's family members. People that used to be part of his family. Why? Because as they come back down, they know they'd be in good hands. First of all, that they'll take care of him. However, this also explains how dogs are unbelievably overprotective over their owners. You know why? It's their family. Dogs are sometimes very overprotective over anything else. They are so committed to human beings. And they say, because sometimes, sometimes it's a person from the extended family that Hashem says, if you're coming back as a dog, at least come back and be around your own family members. And let alone, it explains their character of how they behave around their owners and how emotionally connected they are to them. And we see how they're also completely unloyal to other people. Besides being loyal, dogs are brazen. Chatsufim. And they have a very, very strong desire for food and for sex. Mostly for food and for sex, more than anything else. The te'ava, this desire that they have for mating, comes from one place. Also from Sefer Bereshit. Comes from the time of Noah. In the time of Noah, when all the animals were on the, on the te'ava, there were a couple of rules. One of the rules, you can't have relations on the boat. Yet, three did have relation on the boat. One is the raven, two is the dog, 
And the third one is Ham, which is Noah's son. Son had ha, uh, Noah had Ham, Shem, Ve'afet. Ham had relations. One day I'll tell you that the deeper story to that. That's why he turned back. That's besides that. It goes deeper, deeper and deeper and deeper. So now, dogs, if you don't know this, get locked up during relations. When dogs mate, they don't, once the, the, the ma'ase is done, they're stuck. They can't separate. And it's a curse. That's one of the curses that he got from that time. Because the curse is that they are locked, that they are locked up like that during relations. And when they are not in relations, they are locked up by humans. That they put a leash on them. It's one of the few animals that throughout history has been always on a leash by a human being. Their desire for food is incredible. Even if you see the most trained, or maybe let me not give that example because it might be, not be possible, but most dogs, as much as they are completely protective of their owners, and they're well-trained, and they might even be guard dogs. But as soon as you throw a piece of meat next to them, they forget everything. Anybody who wants to rob a house, or anybody, or well, maybe this is how they used to do back in the days. A couple of steaks, they throw to the dogs, and then they move forward. Because they can't, they can't, over, they, they get overwhelmed with their desire for food. As a matter of fact, Kelev chozer al a dog, can actually throw up and after he throws up he goes back and eats it that's his desire for food anybody who's been a dog owner here would know this that's how how much their tava is for food there's a lot to be said about dogs but here here's a bunch of Jews talking about dogs halachically are we allowed to have dogs as pets? Welcome. Halachically, no. The answer is no. Halachically, no. But let's say why yes. As a matter of fact, you are allowed to have a dog as a pet. But it's conditional. As long as. As long as you're using it for guarding purposes. As long as it has its own space. And as long as it's tied up. And we're not talking about all the other things for medical reasons, for service dogs. Those are 100% allowed. You can even bring a dog into a shul uh, if somebody needs it. We're not talking about those things. Just this whole concept of dog as a pet, it's a Goyish concept. It's never been a Jewish concept. I mean, we see a lot of Jews that have dogs now. But throughout history, it's, it wasn't very common. And we'll go into it a little bit deeper to see why. And when it comes to getting a dog for therapy or for emotional uh, comfort, for that you have to see a rabbi. You have to see if the rabbi can see that it's really something real or you're just using that as a crutch. But as to have a dog as a pet, halakhically to know. <coughs> the Talmud says, now I want you to know, I've been a dog owner. I love dogs. And reading this, I just, I'm just learning how to be a Jew. That's all I can tell you. I'm sorry, the Talmud says, Rule number one, if you are going to raise a dog, you got to put him on a leash. Going back to his punishment from Noah. Wow, it's a big quote from big rabbis that say, he says, anybody who raises a mean dog in his house, he it holds uh, Hashem back from doing chesed with him in his house. Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak Omer, doing kindness with him, benevolence with him. He says, Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak Omer, af porek min He says, even takes away from him the fear of God. 
having a mean dog at home. What? Maybe. I mean, they, they, they say you, so owners look like the dog, they, they, they have certain characteristics. Yeah, I'm saying if you have a mean dog, you have a mean owner. Good point. Possible. Of course, because you train the dog, and it's the way you train him, just like children. But this whole concept of a dog preventing one from God's benevolence in his home and inhibiting him from having fear of God is connected to Amalek. The dog is connected to our biggest enemy. The one that there's no two ways about it. We have to destroy Amalek. That's the halakha. And the dog somehow is connected to them. If we go to Sefer Shemot, this is also very interesting. The 17th chapter on the 8th Pasuk There's a famous Pasuk and the famous Rashi. But today we're going to learn it out with the theme of the dog. This is right after the Jewish people left Egypt. They are no longer slaves. Ten, uh, ten Makot, the splitting of the sea. They're on the other side of the ocean. They're a free nation. The whole world witnessed the glory of God and His mighty power. Comes this chutzpah nation, this nation of Amalek, and goes to fight the Jews. Aren't you embarrassed? Don't you know that the God of the Jews, Hashem, the creator of the world, just saved the Jewish people? You can go fight them? Aren't you scared? You're going to die? No. They were brazen. They did it. They said, well, we know we're going to die. We know we're going to die. But Rashi explains it beautifully with a mashal. Look what he says. He says, why do we read this particular section over here to the to Yetziat Mitzayim? So, the rab- uh, so he, he gives a story. He says, I am your God. I'm always next to you. I'm always giving you everything that you need. All your wants and needs, I'm fulfilling them. Because right after Yetziat um, Mitzrayim, they began to complain. And they're coming and they're saying, is there a God amongst us or not? He says, you know what? There was a God in Egypt. He saved us. There was a God in, the, oh, in Yetziat Mitzrayim. He saved us. But is He here now in the desert? Is God with us? Is He amongst us? So he says, I'm the God that's always taking care of you, asking if I'm around. He says, because of that, now the dog is going to come and bite you. Who's the dog? Amalek. Amalek came to bite them. He says, and then you're going to scream to me, and then you'll know where I am. It's like a, it's like a kid, there's another mashal that he gives over here. He says he took a, it's like a, a, a parable of a father that takes his kid and he puts him on his shoulders. And they're walking around. And the kid, He says they're walking and then his son sees something on the ground and he tells him, Abba, can you get it for me? And his father grabs it and gives it to him. And again, Abba, can you get this for me? He takes it. Abba, can you get that for me? He takes it and he gives it to him. Again and again and again. Every time he wants something, he picks it up and he gives it to him. All of a sudden, he, this, this child that's riding on the shoulders of his father is meeting another person and he tells him, Did you see my father? He says, you don't know where I am? He says, okay, here. He put him on the ground and right away, what happened? A dog came and bit him. What's the story over here? It says that the Jewish people, Hashem is walking beside them, protecting them, but they... Carrying them. And they're acting like, where is God? Is He amongst us? He says, let me show you what happens when I'm not around you. Amalek, boom! That child, boom! 
כלב. From here we learn that the animal that belongs to Amalek is the כלב. Furthermore, on the dog, this is all uh, I'm citing from the Talmud. Rav Amar, נשים כשפניות משחקות בו. Says the dog, women that deal with witchcraft, play with them. ושמואל אומר, רוח רעה שורה עליו. And, and, and Shmuel says that a bad spirit rests upon dogs. Furthermore, ואמרו חכמים, and our sages say, ארור מגדל כלבים וחזירים. Cursed is he, the one who raises dogs and pigs. Why? מפני שהזיקן מרובה ומצוי. Because they are very well known to damage and to hurt, and it's common. It's not rare. Harsh. But it's true. The German shepherds. Traumatized. Yeah. Yeah. This is... Yeah. Why don't we say that the same way that human beings... We don't say they human beings. Mm-hmm. You're saying they dogs. They're human beings in one way and they're human beings in a different way. There are dogs that might be one way. We did, we did that at the beginning of the class. We did that whole part. Okay. There's the whole part where we love the dog and all the, the good qualities. Sorry. This is the, the <laughs> other part. Go back online, you'll see it, but very good question. Believe me, I, I, we're not knocking the dog. We're no, just... We the, we're, it's, just <laughs> it's just the two sides that there are, and you came into the side of the, the other side. The negative side. Yeah. So here's another story of a yeshiva bachur. This is a story in Israel. A learned boy. A learned man. He's in his late 20s. Married. Top student in the yeshiva. Good looking, funny, bal midot, chesed, gives charity, does it all, does everything. He's the perfect guy. His friends will tell you, his Rosh Yeshiva will tell you, he's the best guy in the world. He's got everything going on for him. Yet he can't have children. And he tried everything. And you think such a perfect uh, avrech from the yeshiva shouldn't have such a hard time. And you know, it was an ongoing story for many, many years. One day he goes to visit his Rosh Yeshiva and he gets a text from his wife. And he tells the Rosh Yeshiva, I'm sorry, I know we're supposed to do something right now, but I have to go, I have to go walk the dog. The Rosh Yeshiva looked at him and asked him, you have a dog at home? Do you not know the repercussions of having a dog at home? And he commanded him to get rid of that dog. And wouldn't you know it, that year his wife got pregnant. That year he was a lot more successful in his learning and all he did. Because he says from the Pasuk, Aru Megadel Klavim. Cursed is the one that raises dogs. And the, the Pasuk that we learned right before, We see, no, that's not the Pasuk I was looking for. Ah, there's a bad spirit that lies on dogs. Now, you see that she got pregnant from not having a dog. Let's talk about why have dogs become so popular with women lately? You're very close. <laughs> You're very, very close. Well, but I'm going to. Well, let me give you a, a Torah learning. Let's learn it out to, uh, through the Torah. So the Kelev, we know, is the animal that is Kulo Lev. He is all heart. What is the numerical value of the word kelev? Let's do it. Chaf is 20. Lamed is 30. Bet is 2. Altogether, 
52. Now, <laughs> what is the gematria of the word ben, which is a child? Mm-hmm. Bet is two, noon is 50, 52. 52 kelev, 52 ben. Anytime that the gematria is similar, know that there's a correlation between the two, that there's a connection between the two. There's a connection between Kelev and Ben. Now, the women of this generation have replaced their desire for companionship, their desire for children and dogs. Nowadays, when you're 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, that's the right time, get married. But today, 40 became the new 20. So what happens? In those 20 years while you're touring the world and you're partying and you're having a good time and you're vacationing and you're just eating up life, right? You're missing out on the reason why you came into this world, which was to procreate. The mitzvah is purvu. The first one is to get married and have children. So as long as you're not doing that, there's a void there's a void right in the middle of your chest of, uh, that a man feels and a woman feels. A void that you don't have, uh, that you're not married or that you don't have children. And because you have that void, what's going to fill it up? What's going to fill it up? So, we take a dog that is kulolev, that gives you all the love and doesn't talk back, that gives you all the emotion that you want, that will sit for you, that when you open up the door, will wag its tail for you, will give you all the emotion that you want, whether you're a man or a woman, without the hassle, and it fills that void. And for women, that as they get older, you see that they, whether they know it or they don't know it, subconsciously they know they need to have a child, what do they do? They get a puppy. And now they've quieted down. They've quieted down that that buzz in their mind, where's the child? Why? Because they're receiving love. They're getting satisfied. They're getting their emotional uh, uh, filled with the dog over there. So we can see that the gematia of Ben is exactly the gematia of Kelev. But I'm going to prove it to you scientifically. This is going to blow your mind. New research shows that when a canine meaning when a dog stares into the eyes of a human being, they activate the same hormonal response that bonds us to human infants. When a dog stares into a person's eyes, it starts to release these chemicals in the mind, the same chemicals that you get when you look into a baby's face. Animal behaviorists at Azabu University in Sagamihara, Japan, in Kikusui's lab, did studies and that say that oxytocin, a hormone that plays a role in the maternal bonding trust when a mother stares into her baby's eyes. So when a mother is looking into the baby and the baby's looking into her, the, baby oxyt- the baby's oxytocin levels rise, which cause the infant to stare back into its mother's eyes, which causes the mother to release more oxytocin, and so on. And this positive feedback loop seems to create a strong emotional bond between mother and child during the time when the baby expresses itself in other ways. And the dog have hijacked that human emotion. Puppy eyes. You ever heard of that? When dogs just look you straight in the eyes, they're releasing that. And that's why women get fulfilled when they have that puppy. Because they feel like there's a baby in their hand. Because it is a baby. It's a baby that never And they out. talk to it like a baby. A dog yes. A baby that never out. Yes. That's exactly what it feels like. You have to intuit and it looks at you just like a baby. That's what it is. That's what we're learning out over here. They do. Yeah. Okay, so some animals, you know, they have, you can look into their eyes and see that they have a good soul. Some of them are like really mean. Could be. So does that mean that the person that's incarnated is like, was a very mean person? 100% possible. 100%. One of the incarnations is for bad people to fix themselves. 
Hashem gives him another chance. He, he drops him a level in order to fulfill the tikkun so they can come back up a level and, and, and graduate to their, to, to their ultimate tikkun, which is to bring back the neshama the way that they brought it, or at least to a level where it can go through a cleansing process in Gehenom and then go to heaven. That's for another class. Now, this, this whole study that we did today has just brought us full circle to the title of the class, The Generation of the Dog. The Generation of the Dog, it says, This is in Masechet Brachot. It, talks, it says over there that the dogs customarily or normally uh, bark in the second uh, uh, shift of the night. When you learn out in Masechet Brachot, it talks about the different shifts of the night, different time slots. So there's a, a time slot, let's say after midnight, the second one at around 3 a.m. and on. That's when the dogs begin to bark. So, Achar Chatzot, after midnight, in the second Mishmeret, is when the dogs begin to bark. Look how beautifully we can learn this out. The dogs bark before dawn. What's the Musar over here? What's the Musar Esker? What can we learn out? Right now we're in darkness. When is the dawn? We're in the generation of the dog. This is it. This is it. We're at the end. So it's the darkest before, before dawn. Mashiach is coming. Right? So they say that the Klavim, they bark when? Right before dawn. So why is this generation of the dog? What's this rise of the dog? Why do we go around calling each other, what's up dog? Why are the dogs in strollers? Why do they have boots? Why do they have hats? Why all of a sudden dogs are such a, an item right now? Why? Because right before dawn, the dog comes into the picture. And you can see that right now, it's a prophecy coming true. What do you, when you're telling me, Dor HaKelev, what do you mean Dor HaKelev? Is there any other generation before this one that the dog was such a high item? There were street animals. They would kick it. They would, it would be a curse to say you're a dog. The reason why dogs are part of our fiber of, 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 of society, of life, and the way that they are, and they're, they're held at such high regard, is because it's their generation. It's the generation of the dog. And they say, Pnei Hador, Pnei HaKelev. The face of the, uh, uh, of the generation is, the, is reflecting the, of the face of the dogs. Which means, if you want to know what generation you are, we're in the generation of the dog. In that case, we have to analyze the dog. And we just did that tonight. So let's see, if we analyze the dog, by understanding the dog, we'll understand the generation that we're in. Take a look. The dog, we said today, how are they treated today? On such high regard, they're better than people. I literally saw today, and you know, as I'm preparing this lesson for the dog, I'm like more high alert on dogs. The guys at the park, jogging, and the dogs in a stroller. I saw a dog in Mexico dancing on two legs, dressed up. Uh, you see them, um, you see them in the apps, apps of, you can, you can invite somebody to your house to watch your dog. There's an app for that. Or to watch them. Or a doggy sitter. Or a luxury doggy sitter. What they pay for one night is more than what I pay for my mortgage. <laughs> it's unbelievable. However, what did we learn about the dog, if we want to understand this generation? Is that the dog, Kulo Lev, he's all heart. What does he do? He follows his heart. Where do the desires live? The desires live in the heart. And that's the generation that we're in. We're in the generation where we all follow our desires. Look around. Look around. Everyone is following their desire, whether it's food, whether it's sex, whether it's money, or anything in between. 
It's the generation of desire. You want to understand what's uh, what's doha kelev? Look at the kelev, you understand the generation that you're in. The same way that the dog follows his desires for food and for sex and for anything else and he has no loyalty, that's the generation that we're living in. It's also called entitlement. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. <laughs> We're in a generation that chases desires, that's obsessed with ta'avot and being selfish. Pass the dog, look at it. iPhone, iPhone. I'm taking a selfie, a selfie. I don't need anybody, I can just take my own picture. There's a comedian that says, I'm taking a lonely. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> says, oh, I, there's brands, I love. They don't, you don't eat anybody else. I love by myself. Even the snacks that we eat. Beastly. It's my beastly. It's mine. Before it used to be different. Before it used to be rugalach, krepalach. For you it was. <laughs> what happened? That's the generation we live in. Yeah. It's all around us. Wake up. Yeah. You can't just say it's the norm. It's not the norm. It's a prophecy. Before Mashiach comes, we will be very, very self-absorbed. We'll be driven by desire. We'll be ruled by our insatiable appetite for food, for sex, and for money. I can't stress it enough because it's so true. The characters of a dog are now prevalent in human beings. Now, we can use the positive attributes of the dog and learn from him and be in Dor HaKelev, in the generation of the dog and still be able to merit. How? Like his loyalty. How about being loyal to Hashem? How about having the loyalty of a dog to Hashem? The loyalty of, of a dog the, as a human being to God. That'd be interesting. That'd be a nice way to take a spin on... Hazak, I have something else to add to that, but after class. <laughs> How about the protectiveness, the protection that the dog has over its owner and over its things? How come we don't have our protect protectiveness over our Torah and our religious lives? Why don't we protect ourselves? How about the acts of kindness that he does to others? That we just spoke about, all these different roles that he plays. Why don't we do chesed with others? We could learn from the dog. In the time of Mashiach, which is now, which is now, we're not predicting the time. We don't know the time. But this is the generation. It's all coming true. 70 nations against Israel. Turn on the news. Turn on the news. It was just last week. Last week they voted against us. 70 versus 1. That's a prophecy. Check it off. Generation of the dog. That's a prophecy. Check it off. As a matter of fact, it said in the time of Mashiach, there will be a rise of Ishmael and Edom. Who's Ishmael? The Arabs. Who's Edom? The Europeans or the Americans. You see that now, all of a sudden, when's the last time that Arabs were so in the news? Every day, everywhere. They're so brazen. They're so brazen. You see them. It's, it's unbelievable the way that they're acting right now. In different, they go into different countries and they're imposing themselves and they're, and they're being completely anarchist about the, their approach. Sharia law. Caliphate. Caliphate. All the, these different things. In the sports, they attack the Israeli uh, team. The soccer. soccer team. They did? Yes. It's because they know they'll win them. You saw that Israeli judo fighter a few years ago? He won. He won. He kicked his butt. He wouldn't shake his hand. Disgusting. In the time of Mashiach, we'll see the rise of Ishmael and Edom. In Sefer Bereshit, it says, Yado bakol veyado kolbo. Talks about the characteristic of our enemy. That his hand is in everything. He's a thief. Veyado kol, veyad kolbo. He's involved in everything. 
If you take the last word, kolbo, is kalbo, like a, like a dog. It says that he is going to behave like a dog. And we see that the negative attributes of a dog are shown nowadays in the goyim. This klipa that is Amalek, that is embedded in the animal that is called the dog, is now showing in the people of the generation. It's showing in their character, and it's just a sign of Mashiach. The generation of the dog is a prophecy come true. So the next time you see a dog in boots, or a puppy with a manicure, or somebody, or a dog being pushed in a stroller, feel great, Mashiach is coming. <laughs> 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 <laughs>